Thank you, Kevin. That was beautiful. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to St. Matthew's. Good morning. Thank you. Whether you're worshiping here with us in the sanctuary on this beautiful day, or you're joining us online, we're very glad you're here. We're surrounded by beauty, which often fills our soul and sometimes can be hard. So we have a lot of people that hike the trails behind us here. For those of you online, we're right across the street. Now, I said it was a national park, but I heard it was a national forest. It's not even that. A national recreation area. And a state park. And there's also county parks. Anyway, it's a beautiful hiking, uh, set of hiking trails. And the mountain behind us here, Boney Mountain, is, uh, is the peak we look at as we drive up today. It was covered in clouds. And we lost somebody this week. And, um, you know, it's always a tragedy, but especially when that person is so young. And uh, we are aware of that. And uh, for Zachary's family, if you happen to be watching or if you watch this later, we are praying for you. Pastor Christy, who's one of our own, she was across the street here while the search parties were going out um, all Thursday morning. And um, we gave water out to the hikers and the searchers, and then, but, but she found herself praying more than, than giving water and found a family friend. We thank you for being here in the search party as well. Um, and to know that our church here in the community is not just a church sitting across the street, but we really do care. So. For those of you, uh, I know some of you actually had personal attachments to this family. I know uh, one of our own, uh, her son and uh, Zachary grew up going to scouts together and are standing together in the Eagle, both Eagle Scouts who, who received that honor at the same time. And you know, there's, there's so many ways in which we connect with people. You know that whole thing with Kevin Bacon, six points off, whatever. I think, I think it's a whole lot closer than that, and uh, especially when we consider as a faith we're together in so many ways that count, including the power of the Holy Spirit that brings life out of death. So we're praying for that, and we're praying for those that are, the, the, the next thousand that are across the street here for God to be with them. It's, it's a strange life we live, isn't it? It's always full of new things in life and blooming and uh, Springs around the corner, believe it or not. So we got a little more winter to do, but the reminder that new life comes out of death. It's God's specialty, by the way, to take things that are dead and bring them to life again. And then we also know that uh, this week's also been full of blessings, and uh, we want to give thanks to God for that. Our whole focus today on worship is going to be on salt and light. Uh, and uh, so let's continue on with worship this morning. Thank you, Tina. Please stand for the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Lord be in our minds. So we can be purified with salt. The Lord be in our hearts. So we can be in our now join me in the opening prayer. Lord God Almighty, you no longer want us to mourn in sackcloths and ashes. You no longer desire burnt offerings on the altar. You want us to be the salt to impact the world. You want us to be the light to shine in the realm of this globe. May it be so in us today. Amen. Remain standing for the opening hymn, Here I Am to Worship. Yeah, Here I Am to Worship is our opening hymn. And uh, in First Chronicles 16.34, we read, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love, for his mercy endureth forever. So this is Here I Am to Worship.
This morning, Serve, our Ministry Serve Committee is kicking off a donation drive to benefit Journey Out. And I believe there's some slides up there. Journey Out, their motto is survival, hope, and freedom. And it's for women who have been trafficked and sold, who are looking to find a new life in a new way. And because it is February, we see a lot of hearts around, but it's also a reminder of the love God has for us, that agape love, and that agape love we show each other, and hopefully those in our community who can use help. So today, we have a poster. Uh, Kathleen Chamberlain will be uh, Vanna White in the back with this after service. There are different items that you can donate, take a heart with you. There's also a little heart candy to sweeten the deal back there. Um, some of the objects might be um, $25 gift card to Ralph's or Target. Those are the stores nearby them. They're in Van Nuys. There are a local group helping, helping with this. And then there's also leggings, different sizes, socks, uh, athletic shoes, uh, hoodies, body wash, shampoo, all things to help women feel new and loved again. So uh, Rick has uh, Target gift cards. If you want to purchase those through him, some of that goes back to our church through our script program. So that's a way you can help twice if you're inclined. So. You can talk to me or her if you have any further questions about this. Um, we're asking the donations to come back by February 19th. There'll be a box in the back for the items, and there's also a box for cash donations or for the gift cards. So thank you for considering this prayerfully and uh, sharing that agape love with others. Welcome any children up here or uh, joining us from home. Uh, we've had some serious topics this morning. This uh, helping people start a new life, helping people cope with a loss of life. Um, we're going to turn to a little more, a little less serious topic uh, in that I guess the two teams that are going to be in the Super Bowl next week have been uh, decided on, and uh, I have a couple, I know that certain teams go by certain colors, so I have this uh, outfit, so, whoops, there goes my, yeah, that'd be great. So what team would that be, anyone know? The Chiefs from Kansas City, 
And then uh, my other hanger here fell apart, but what would this team be? The B from the Eagles from Philadelphia, all right. So one thing with teams and schools, they often have, thank you, team or school colors, and that's how you know them. Now in the Bible, it talks how do you know someone who's not a follower necessarily of uh, the Philadelphia football team or the uh, UCLA basketball team, but a follower of Jesus. And it says that the followers of Jesus wear orange and black. So that's what I'm wearing here. <laughs> but wait a minute, wait, wait. So orange and black are the Halloween colors. Uh, if you're a follower of ha Halloween, you wear orange and black. Pastor, I don't remember, what does the Bible say that you wear? What color do you wear so people know you're a follower of Jesus? Uh, followers of Jesus were not defined by color. And they were actually defined by fruit. Ah, so by their fruits you should know them. Mm -hmm. Is that what it says? That's what it says. All right, so, so, um, so would then the followers of Jesus, do you think they would be the bananas or the oranges? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. This is the fruits of the Spirit. Ah, the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. That's how you know the followers of Jesus. Yeah. By the fruits of their Spirit, by how they react to the world and how they yes. uh, develop relationships and interact with other people and, yeah. with, and with God. So, huh, can anyone remember maybe what one of the fruits of the Spirit is? Mm. Patience. Patience. Patience, all right. Patience, yes. Another one? Kindness. Kindness, yeah, good. I've got nine of them listed here. Peace, yep. Love. Love. Gentleness. Joy, gentleness, I hear. Self-control. Self generosity. Generosity. Compassion. Compassion. All these great things. Now, people, a lot of people are going to be enjoying themselves watching the Super Bowl next week. And, but in order for us to show that we are the followers of Jesus, we're going to share show our love and kindness uh, by bringing some canned goods. So it can be soup for Super Bowl, or if it wanted you canned fruit or canned beans or any other canned goods would be fine. We're gonna like have two, two stacks up here. If you're uh, rooting for Kansas City, you'll put your cans on one side, and if you're rooting for Philadelphia, you can put your cans on the other side. Uh, so, uh, so let's pray for a minute, God. I know that uh, in our lives you can tell people who they follow, oftentimes by what they wear. Uh, but in your case, you know we, you, we are known by our fruits. You can know followers of Jesus by their fruits. And the fruits, as we've talked about, are love, gentleness, kindness, patience. And we're going to share what we have with others. Reach out in love, both to the people working with Journey Out to start new lives, and to people, our canned goods are going to go to foster families uh, who, who um, get supplied by James Storehouse, a local charity. So we're gonna reach out in love and connection to them as well. Thank you, amen. Scripture this morning is from Matthew 5, 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on the hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lamp stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. And truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these, the least of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same, will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God. And today's anthem is written by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. We're doing uh, Ave Verum Corpus, and the, the Latin text translates in English to Hail, true body, born, having truly suffered, sacrificed on the cross for mankind, from whose pierced side water and blood flowed. Be for us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in the trial of death. O sweet Jesus, O holy Jesus, O Jesus, have mercy on me. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, for Christmas, uh, two of our sons and, and our daughters in love, they, uh, they were trying to figure out what they're going to get us, and uh, they decided to send us to school. But it was a cooking class, so we were all in. You know the best part about a cooking class? You get to eat it, right? All right. So, so we went to Sir Le Tol not been there it's I think it says table but it's it's a uh, anyway it's a fancy place where you pay lots of money for kitchen stuff but in the back there's a there's a cooking area and so there's a chef there and he's he's a French trained chef and he's also he went to the um, Suzuki school the 
sous chef. He's a sous chef. He has all these degrees. He's traveled the world. He, he spent much time explaining how not to cut our fingers off. That was the first thing he said. Because, you know, a sharp knife is the most important thing you have in a kitchen, by the way. But there was a second ingredient that he was um, talking about. And in all of the stages of our cooking, he talked about the significance of salt and how there's different kinds of salt. There's sea salt, which I think is where most of it comes from anyway, but, uh, and there's kosher salt. And then there's that table salt. And then there's the salt that is a solid mass in the South because they've got to put rice in it because it all just formed into a salt lick, which we used to take out at restaurants and my mom, anyway, it was a, so I lived in Florida and there in Florida in those days, if you didn't remember to put rice in your salt, then it became a salt lick. And in fact, it had, we had caps on top of our salt shaker. It was a, it was a plastic cap and then it would pop off. So that was all the humidity all the time would mean you had to do something to preserve the salt to keep it salty. It was more fun to whack it on the table. So my mom got the plastic things and did this. But this is, uh, this is such an important ingredient. And we don't really understand how important it was in modern day culture, what salt meant. Because in the days of Jesus, in the ancient world, salt was the difference between life and death. Quite simply, it was the preservative. Refrigeration wasn't the way you kept anything from turning rancid or becoming bacterial. Um, apparently today we found that uh, mold can grow anywhere. So uh, when, when uh, Nancy was, was bringing out our communion elements, I, there's a carafe that I use to pour the wine into the cup, the juice into the cup, and it's a way for you to see and for us to realize how important this was for Jesus as he was at the table. They had just had their Seder meal. Um, and by the time we get to the, the cup, they have just had the Seder meal. So they've already had the bread, the matzah. There's always salt that is on the Seder meal. There's always salt that's a reminder of the bitterness of the, and the bitter root. And um, that is always on the table as well in the Seder meal to remind people of how bad it was. But that salt in those days... Uh, it drove people to insanity if they didn't have enough. And I know doctors tell us to cut way back on our sodium and all that good stuff. How many have been told that? And, well, let me just say, if you put them on chips with a little salsa, it doesn't matter how much salt you eat. It's just, but anyway, this was, this was a big deal. This was life or death to entire communities, villages that didn't have enough salt would literally die of starvation because they couldn't preserve meat. They couldn't hold uh, vegetables in stasis. They weren't able to preserve things over time. And salt not only was good for that, but it was also a way for people to survive if it got bitter cold or if they had to actually preserve water over time, they would use it as a way of kind of a decontamination of water sources. So when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, he's preaching and he's standing on this hillside and he's trying to impress upon them how important it is for you to be engaged with this world, to be evangelists and, and, and good news deliverers and to be integral into people's societies and be connected to the way they live and how they were moving about in their life. If you wanted to have some kind of impact, you needed to continue to be salt and light. So it's by no uh, you know, accident that this follows his teaching that we had already talked about earlier, the Beatitudes. As he stood on that hillside and taught this, he, he was telling us that by having a poor in spirit, I'm not going to go back and retranslate all these for us, but just trust me that these are most of the Beatitudes in more modern language. It's a compliant spirit. It's caring deeply, so deeply that we mourn for if we mourn truly, then we are moving from death to life. That is what mourning is, by the way. To mourn is to move from death and the recognition of our loss to a place of light and life. We often think of mourning as heading in the wrong direction. In fact, we've tried to talk people out of it. Gosh, it's been a couple of years. What's, what's wrong with you? 
Why aren't you back out there again? Why aren't you, why aren't you emerging into this new place? Morning, and the word morning of the dawning of a new day, it historically is the same word. To take you through the night until there would be morning. Just like in creation, when God separated the light from the dark. So Jesus also then leans forward to say, if you truly care, you will mourn and you will be comforted in this because you are doing the hard work. I promised a story last week I didn't have time for. This week, I still don't have time, but I have to tell you. <laughs> so I was youth pastor at Chula Vista United Methodist Church. And uh, I, I, my job was the youth group, uh, junior high, senior high, and all of those betweeners that we were trying to get into the group. And and uh, we were going to go on a camping trip together, and so I was looking for a pickup truck to borrow, and I heard that there was a woman who had a pickup truck. Her husband used to volunteer it at the church all the time. So I said, great, I'll go visit her. So I went, and I thought I was visiting both of them. And when I got to the door, and she invited me in, and, oh, pastor, I'm so glad you're here, and yeah, we've got a truck on the side of the house, and uh, my husband's not here right now. I could see his seat. I could smell the pipe tobacco smoke in the house, but he just wasn't there. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'll catch up to him another time. She told me all about how they were involved for so many years, but that he got sick and he, he just can't go out anymore. So I borrowed the truck, did the camping trip, brought it back, thanked her. And then the second visit, that was the second visit. And the third visit, I went back to see her again and said, hey, I just was curious because you know, I'd really like to thank your husband and meet him. And, and then that went to a fourth visit. And then finally she said, well, he died a year ago. And I, I was pretty young and I was pretty inexperienced, but I knew enough to sit down and just sit there with her for a while. And I intentionally sat in his seat. And I don't know, that was maybe divine intervention. I wasn't smart enough to know this was the next step to help people in their grief, but she said, oh, it's, it's good that you're sitting in that seat. Nobody has sat in that seat for a long time. I said, you know, I've smelled uh, the pipe tobacco smoke. And she said, yeah, every morning I get up and I light his pipe for him. And then she said, I'd like to show you something. And this is when I got a little freaked out because I thought we're going back into a closet, into the bedroom. And... <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll let your imaginations run with that. Um, so I said, well, what, what is it that you would like to show me? And she said, here, I want to, and she pulled out two brand new pairs of leather shoes, patent leather shoes, one black, one brown pair. And she said, my husband bought these. What, what size are your feet? I said, oh, well, they're 10 and a half or 11. She said, perfect. We paid a lot of money for these. And um, we'd re I know you're going off to seminary. I know you're, you're having to leave in a couple months. And I just wanted you to know, I want you to take these with you. Huh. Well, I put those shoes on and they lasted me a long time. And every time I put them on, I was thinking about her and this connection to things. And the next time I went over to her house, and then the last time I went to her house, she had, there was no longer any pipe smoke in the house, and things started to get changed around. Furniture was moved. Her husband's clothes came to our, our, you know, our clothing closet at the church, and life started to move forward again. Grief is just a part of life. It's God's business to take whatever we're dealing with and move us to light and to what's next. But that's why the Beatitudes are very clear about who are going to be recognized in their work. The merciful, to be merciful, means truly to immerse ourselves in another person's life and go through the difficulty and the pain and not try to rush people through things that are uncomfortable to us. Now, in your own family, this happens all the time. We can't stand to see our kids suffer. But instead of getting with them and paralleling them, walking alongside them through that pain, we want to fix things. Any fixers in the room? Okay, well, 
what, do, what happens when we fix it? Every time there's a little bit of pain and we keep fixing it and fixing it and fixing it and fixing it. I'll tell you what happens. They're 40 and they're still living at your house. <laughs> Humble, leading from the back. The, those that are Humble. There's another word that's used in the Beatitudes, but it's basically leading from the back. And then finally, peacemakers. So right after Jesus teaches this to his disciples, now remember that he taught that to a smaller group of people. He brought them up with him into the mountainside. They actually came to him for some teaching. And this was the very beginning of his ministry. And we don't know exactly how many sermons are preached at once because it's hard to understand. See, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7 are all the Sermon on the Mount. And it has to do with money. So my friend used to call it the Sermon of the Amount. But, you know, there was this, all this sort of focus in here about how we are to live as Christians in the world and what kind of impact we have on other people. But this is when he gets to salt and light. And I want to tell you about the salt and the light that I experienced uh, two weeks ago when I was in off the coast of Georgia for this training on retreats and small group ministry and churches and our focus needed going forward post-pandemic. I got to meet the Agichi Kula, and I, I, I didn't know anything about these folks, but I knew something about their history because, see, the, the coast of Georgia, there's a, there's a number of islands, Jekyll Island, there's Simon's Island. There's, there's all these islands and inlets. And it was the perfect place back in the early well, 1700s and before that where slave traders would bring slaves from Africa. They would sail out of England. They would uh, move down the coast. This happened to be true of a very famous ship called the Wanderer. And it was actually built as a luxury yacht, and it was, uh, it was for the rich. And then uh, an entrepreneurial group of men bought this and decided that when they were running salt at the time, but salt was not enough money, so people would make more money. That's how slave trade really got started. See, the salt routes became more profitable if they could bring people back and sell them. So this is where we're at. We have now descendants of these slaves that were in the coastal area of Georgia. And many times, including the wanderer, when it would run up into the harbor area or hide away in some of their marshlands, they would unload the slaves. They would take them to um, you know, clearings in the, in the jungle that no one could find. And they would heat them up with fires and those that were still alive. They'd feed them enough so they didn't look so emaciated. And then they would basically get them ready, put a little sun on their skin and haul them off to Atlanta to the slave market. This was a regular process of human trafficking. I would love to say that we as people have somehow progressed, but we haven't. Lord, have mercy on us. These are the descendants of those slaves. The Gichi community and the community center and the, and the historical arts center that is there in South Georgia and in South Carolina is a place of remembrance. But these people continue to wear their appropriate clothing. You'll notice that in a lot of the Gichi groups, and I'll, uh, there's a connection here you'll recognize in a minute, but the, the white apron was worn constantly, especially by the women, because that was their status. It was kind of their uniform. But the upper blouses and clothing were always a mixture of their tribal colors. They would try to bring in whatever was given to them by the slave traders with colors that they would instinctually know. Somehow, these are the colors, even though they didn't know what tribe they came from, they would learn how to communicate with others to find out where they had come from by their dialect, because none of them could speak English, and they also couldn't read or write. So that was part of the dehumanization of a slave was to take away everything that could possibly progress them in their own life so that they would somehow meld into the background, just become a part of the, the houseware. And so the, the, 
these women and, and the men who we met that came and, and performed for us that day, these eight people are direct descendants of slaves. They have very carefully curated their history to make sure. Now, what is a ring shouter? Well, ring shouters was the, was the rhythm in which they used in order for them not to forget where they came from and to continue to be salt in other people's wounds. Not just for preservation, for getting people's attention and not letting us forget. So the ring shouter clap, and I'm going to try, but I'm not very good at this, but it's kind of a... And that's that's still wrong, but it's close enough. And it's this... It, 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 moves, it moves you to kind of a three-step step, and that became their dance. And while they were working in the fields, they would start to use these claps to communicate because that's how their tribes used to communicate with each other in Africa. They used drums, they used, they used rhythm. And then when they were picking cotton, they would be singing songs that would have these same kind of rhythms that were inherent in that. In fact, one of the ancient songs that we've kind of, I think, I don't know. We've kind of watered it down into something very singable, and we do it very white, by the way, because we've got rhythms that are kind of, you know, we're. Have you ever tried to get a group of people to clap? Uh, <laughs> see, here's the thing about white people, and I'm one of them, so I'm just speaking for a Caucasian, someone from Wales. Um, uh, it's, and my mom was from everywhere, so I'm kind of the Heinz 57, mostly Welsh. But I love, and I, in the South, I could not get enough of the spirituals, especially when someone was singing and where it mattered to them. And so we would try to get people and, you know, we would sing like, so like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Now you get white people to clap on this and it's always one in three. It's like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Like we've got to have a downbeat. But that's not the way it's sung. And and this was actually an African-American spiritual. This little light of mine. Okay, let's pick that key. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Now we're going to go on two and four. There you go. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't let Satan get out. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, oh, don't let Satan move it out. I'm gonna let it shine. See, that's two and four. That's it. Do it. Now keep going. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. just can't stay on two and four it is hard it's hard because it forces us to do something and hear a language and sing a song that it just isn't part of our soul but when it is a part of your soul and it's a part of your history this woman by the way is in her 90s she's blind she's blind and she gets up there and she does her singing and her dancing to remind us of this. Now, she and her friends were in the original television series from 1977 called Roots. And they taught the people that were on the set and the people that were there, especially when they were doing the scenes in Africa and then the scenes when Kunta Kinte was sold into slavery. They were teaching all these Hollywood people how to be ring shouters. Now, the most famous ring shouter of all time, I think, is probably uh, this woman. And her name was Bessie Jones. If you've never listened to her, 
think I got it right. It's either Smith or Jones, but I can't remember. <laughs> Obviously not her original name, but the plantation name she was given. Look it up. Look up Ring Shouters and, and just listen to some of their music because it's the, it's the music that actually created what is an American music genre called jazz. This is where it all comes from. And jazz is this flow from the odd rhythms of life into this. But these folks are still trying to be salt to the world. It, it, it preserves what is supposed to be preserved and it's, it, it's bitter enough that it reminds us that life is so bitter sometimes. Salt and light. This is what Jesus was after. If you're gonna live with a compliant spirit and you're gonna be comforted when you care enough about people to remember and mourn them, when you're merciful in, in your relationship with other people, if you're continuing to move through uh, from the back, but you're being a peacemaker along the way, it's necessary for us then to understand our job today is to be salt and light, not to be necessarily just somebody who's not noticed and hanging there. You can lead from the back and be salty. You, you can move back. By the way, this preacher, um, let me go back. She actually is, I would call a modern day ring shouter because she's She's uh, teaching at one of our Methodist seminaries, and um, oh, Sister Joy was, whew, she got this group of mostly white camp leaders up on their feet and praising God and clapping on two and four. I mean, this was how much power was in her preaching. And she did not leave it out there as, this is how salty she was. She opened up her last sermon on the last day, and she said, there is not a soul in the Bible not one soul who spoke English or had white complexion. None of them. So stop thinking about your Bible as a holy place for white people to go find reasons to be bad to each other. And then she let that hang out there, kind of waft across the top of 350 camp leaders who were going to go home a week later and have a campfire where they were going to talk about the power of scripture. That's not that God doesn't care about all of us, but we got to figure out where we started from, how we got there. My last name's Powell. You know, that comes from Wales. It's mostly the Welsh who have carried that name. It's not English. It's not Irish. It's not from pretty much any other land. And most of our ancestors came from Wales, but obviously a few Powells landed in the South, and obviously they had some slaving going on because Powell is the second most popular name among African-American families in the United States. So, and I've never done one of those 23andMe kind of DNA things. I don't know, maybe I just don't want to know where all of that comes from. But I would not be surprised if someplace in my history or your history we didn't find some connections that we were surprised about. So this is how do we stay salty and how do we continue to be light into the world? Because when a salt has lost its favor, flavor, there's no purpose for it anymore. It's ground up and it's thrown out on the ground and it becomes for us traction, I guess, when we've got to slip around a little bit. There's a lot of salt being used right now throughout the Midwest and the North. They're freezing over there and out there. I guess yesterday we set a record, the, high, the lowest temperature ever with wind chill of 108 degrees below zero. <laughs> Mount Washington. Unbelievable. Our climate is a changing. So here's the whole thing. Jesus was pointing out, if, if you're no good, if you're just no good for anybody, then you're really not much good in the kingdom of God. Now, it's some pretty harsh language Jesus uses here. If you do not have more of a sense of holiness or the presence of God and the things you need to do to live as a person who can influence others in your life, 
then if you're not even better than the Pharisees and the scribes who have been teaching this stuff all these years but not practicing it in their own lives, then you're just not going to get into the kingdom of God. Now, I want to point out something in the main scripture. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to jump back to the last slide of the passage in Matthew uh, that Tina read for us. Kingdom of heaven is not capitalized. This is the term, by the way, that Matthew uses, um, kingdom of heaven. And Mark and Luke, it's mostly kingdom of God. But the kingdom of heaven is, in fact, what happens on earth before we get to that other realm of life beyond our bodies. It's an important distinction because what it means for us is it's how we live here and today. It's how we interact with other people. It's how we build our structures and our policies and our laws. Because the kingdom of God is to come on earth as it is in heaven. You, you, where do we get that language? Gosh, maybe, maybe Jesus taught us how to pray that way. To, to, to have come on this earth as it is in heaven, right? So this kingdom of heaven, it means we're not entering it now because we just haven't engaged it. It doesn't mean we can't get there. It doesn't mean we can't live our eternal life from the moment we say we believe. In fact, that's probably God's preference. This is not wait till you get there someday. This is how are you going to live today? That's why we are salt and light today. That's why we need to be something that people taste and something that people see and that we don't try to hide this. Just like our church, we're on the top of the hill. We're not Boney Mountain, but we're on the way. How much of a light comes from this beacon, this church? We, we were talking a little bit about our mission statement and this beacon and light kept coming up from our different tables that were working on this. And people were saying, well, we are kind of on a hill. Well, yeah, we are on a hill and we don't have a, a beacon. We don't have a we don't have, you know, something at the top of the steeple that goes around like a lighthouse and shows everybody that we're here. But we, we, we have cell phone towers, yes. <laughs> we are radiating waves everywhere. There are hundreds of thousands of phone calls taking place because of this tower right behind that steeple there. Maybe that's the modern day beacon. Maybe that's who we are. But I got a question for you, a good question, a serious question, because before we come to communion, which will happen in a couple of minutes, but what would it be like for you to be salty this week? What would it be like? How would you be salt in your, in your community, your family, with your friends? What would that look like? I have a friend who's really struggling right now with ministry. Not sure. Worn out, tired. Ready for something else or ready for nothing else. Maybe a new career. Maybe retire. Maybe just quit. I was having, I was having lunch with this person. I was having lunch with a bunch of pastors, actually, and just done. I mean, feeling done. I've been there. I know that. I know that feeling. You just The well is dry, and you just think, and a day off is not filling it back up again. So the only thing I could do was listen. By the time that was done, say, what else would you do with your life? Where would there be meaning? Yeah, it's hard. We're all struggling right now. Every church in this nation is struggling to try to convince people that the church is still relevant. What would you do? Where would you go? That wasn't the salty part. That was the irritating part. <coughs> Maybe that is kind of salt a little bit. But at the end of that conversation, I said, wherever you go, I will be there. I will walk with you. I will pray for you. I will love you on the other side of whatever you decide. 
What would it be like for you to be salt this week? Where do we need to be involved in our community to make a difference? I think light is a little more self-explanatory, but salt is a tough one. Is it just to preserve or is it to bring spice to life? We learned that in our cooking class. You put salt in everything, apparently. And if you throw it in through your fingers like this, it tastes so much better. (laughs) If you just go. It's not as good. Let me leave that with you. Because this really was Jesus' purpose to get our attention, to remind us of who we are, to make sure we don't forget who we're going to be. Amen? Amen. And amen. Let us join in our Let's prepare for communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, I'm sorry, did I lose my place? (laughs) He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And after that supper, which included all those ingredients we've talked about, the bitterness of how people suffer and the blessing of what God brings to us. You, O Lord, decided that the only way for us to know who you are truly is for you to sacrifice yourself for us. And you did not go quietly, Lord. You actually stood before the trial You didn't defend yourself. You did not run away from this task that God had given you, your Father in heaven, our Father, Abba. And even when you asked for the cup to pass you, you finally resolved that it was God's will that was more important for all. So that is our meal here, Lord. Our meal to remember you and everything you've done. You offered to your friends and your disciples at that table, the body, and you said, this has been broken, and it is broken for you. Remember. And after that supper was over, Lord, you gave thanks, and then you raised the cup, and you said to them, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Make it be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power of your Holy Spirit. Make it be for us the body and blood so that we may be your body and blood, your body in the world, your witness, your salt, your light. For we pray this all in the name of the Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Will the co-celebrants please come and share in the Lord's Supper. table is open to all of us. It doesn't matter the last time you were in church or the last time you had communion or confession, or if you've never done this before, the table's here because God has given it to us. So come. There are gluten-free choices at the front, but come as the Lord leads you. The blood of our Lord Jesus.
Would you pray with me? Psalm 13, 5 through 6. But I've trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. We are so blessed, Lord, to come before you in freedom to worship. And we lift up Pacoima First United Methodist Church and Ojai United Methodist Church and all your churches around the world who are worshiping you today. You've told us, Lord, we can come to you with requests. So we ask prayerfully that Emery be healed from tendonitis and be able to resume her dancing. When you're 13 and what's in your soul is so important, Lord, so please heal Emery. We ask you to surround the family of Zachary and the family of Rita upon their passing this week. Send your angels to them, help them mourn, help them remember, but help them feel your love. We continue to ask for prayers on those fighting cancer, including that of Joshua. We ask that you give people strength in their recovery, in their treatments. We give thanks that Carrie is recovering and feeling stronger. Let's take a moment of silent prayer for those on our continuing prayer list and those in our hearts. And Father God, help us remember to be the salt of the earth and to be your light in this world. Let your light shine from you through us so people can see and know about you. Would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite you to prayerfully consider your gifts to the church and to our ongoing ministries as we give thanks for what God has blessed us with.
Thank you, Father, for all that you have blessed us with. Please accept these gifts and tithes as just as we give a portion back to you, and may it further your purpose in our world. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. All right. <clears throat> our closing hymn is Breathe on Me, Breath of God, and uh, it's basically about yielding our lives and everything that are really of and because of God and for God um, to him uh, willfully. So, uh, yeah, one verse that comes to mind is 51. Uh, 10 of Psalms, uh, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I think that's a useful prayer to, to actually pray daily <laughs> uh, to be reaccorded with his will. So here's breathe on me, breath of God. Son and the Holy Spirit, let us go and be salt and light wherever we are and with whomever God sends us. Amen. 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 Please be seated. All right. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Pastor? I'm great. I'm great. It's beautiful. Hello. Hello. She has spoken. My husband tells me I'm salty enough. Ah. But I can add to it if you'd like. <laughs> so a lot of great things happening in the church. Did anybody get to come and see that book talk with the authors? Ah, amazing, right? Yes, I heard I had a meeting with Pastor Christy. She said it was just incredible. Just incredible. And at um, the Reagan Library, they are doing a talk on Auschwitz, right? A whole thing. So we might be getting a group together. If you guys are interested, let us know. Um, but we are encouraging everybody to go and see that and, and uh, learn a little bit more about that culture and what happened. Um, and the town show. Wrong date. Do not save this date. Do not save this date. I won't be here. It will be the 30th. The 30th. April 30th. Oh, is that good? Do, what? Oh, yeah, we're going to perform for you. You can come here and we'll have cake, Morgan. We'll have cake. Just for you. Yes, just for Morgan. Okay, talent show, April 30th, save the date. Um, Pastor Jim is doing his Tuesday studies in the Wesley Room. And Carol is doing her studies. And Conejo Connect family. Oh, we're heading over to Westlake Village if you want to go to take a tour of all the churches. Right? On Wednesdays, right? All ages. Okay. What else do we have going on? Uh, youth ministry. Youth group. Fridays, 6 to 7.30. And, oh. Oh. That will be at Chez Moi. I 
better show up. It's at 8.30 in the morning. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Okay, women's breakfast, altar flowers. 40th anniversary, congratulations, lovebirds. The flowers are gorgeous. That's the way, that's how you do that. You're like, oh yeah, there you go, honey, I got you some flowers. Yeah, okay, well, congratulations. That is quite an accomplishment. Lovely, and happy birthday to Dan Gerard, Ramona Hallett. Hi, Ramona. Chuck Qualls, Kathy Warner, and Chris Knadler. I wonder how old Chris is now. Louise, how old is Chris? 14. 14? What? He was the littlest dangerous boy. 14 years old, Chris Knadler. That's amazing. Can we sing happy birthday? Matthew's church family, be the light, stay salty. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs>